Okay, good morning. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed dinner last night, and for some of you, whatever happened after dinner. Uh, but anyway, it, I think it, it, was a, it was a very a very good evening, I think, and I thought people really were enjoying each other's company and enjoying the wonderful food. So uh, this morning, our first item is to really is to um, agree the ballot paper, and uh, we have been working um, after yesterday and taking account of some of the things people have been saying and discussing with our academic and legal team, and we have formulated or reformulated a draft ballot paper, which has been distributed and it is on your table, and you all should have access to it. Um, and the first thing now is to discuss it and to, to uh, ho eventually approve it or approve an amended version of it. And the first question is a straightforward one, I think. It's, it is in line with what the Convention has been charged by the government to do, to ask this straightforward question, should the Constitution be changed to allow for civil marriage for same-sex couples. And we have then, uh, if you like, two supplementary questions. And so that we can be as clear as possible about our starting point in regard to what these questions mean precisely, I'm going to ask Jerry Durkin to, to speak to them. Um, <coughs> good morning, everybody. Um, can I quickly run you through the three questions? Um, should the Constitution be changed to allow for civil marriage for same-sex couples? Well, that's uh, fairly obvious what that means. Could I just explain why the word civil is in there? It is to make it perfectly clear so that there'd be no doubt about it, that you're not talking about a church arrangements or whatever. This is civil marriage, which is what... It's, it's almost unnecessary, but I think it's probably better just to have it spelt out clearly so that it's there. Then the next question, if the Constitutional Convention votes, votes in favour of change, what form should this amendment take? Should it be permissive? In other words, should it say the state may make laws providing uh, for same-sex uh, uh, marriage, or should it say the state shall make laws? Now, the reason why this has some importance is straightforward. If it's the first, if it's permissive, obviously the state can do it, but it doesn't have to do it. So in practical terms... The Oireachtas, the Doyle and the Shannon could bring it in in a six months time if it was passed. They could bring it in in 12 months time. They could bring it in in five years time. They could bring it in in 30 years time. And equally, a further Doyle or Oireachtas, if it was brought in, could say, actually, we don't think it's a good arrangement, so we're going to change it and take it away. The other says, no, you must do this. So the state has to bring it in, and it would have to bring it in within a reasonable time scale. And there, on an ongoing basis, there must be laws providing for this. So it just wouldn't be open to come and say, we're taking it back, we're going to change it, and we're going to remove it. Of course, it could be changed at a future stage by changing the Constitution, so the people would always have the right to say, no, no, actually, we want to make different arrangements now. But that's what it would take a change to the Constitution. The final point that's made is it seemed yesterday there was a lot of discussion about children yesterday. And you may recall I said in my brief opening address that any change to marriage means a change to the family, which means inevitable changes in regard to children and how we set out our arrangements in regard to who has parentage, who has guardianship, who has upbringing. And third question is simply to reflect the fact um, that if there is this change to marriage, well, equally then, there must be change in regard to the arrangements, in regard to parentage, guardianship, and upbringing. And what that just simply means is all the elements, all the rights turning on bringing up children. The state will have to address that, and it will have to bring in legislation and laws to deal with that. And it will have to look at that in detail, as to how that is to be done, but it's simply this question is to reflect the fact that it is to be done and it should be done in the context 
If we change the arrangements for marriage, we should change those arrangements as well as may be necessary to give appropriate protection to children in those circumstances and to give them appropriate rights. So that, that's the thinking behind putting it in those, that format. They kind of logically run one from the other, if you see what I mean. Um, so hopefully that explains uh, the thinking behind the, the format that's been adopted at the moment. Um, so obviously, mm -hmm. I'm happy if anybody has any questions. To okay. take. <clears throat> Thank you, Jerry. Okay, the floor is open. Uh, Ivana, you, again, could get the mic there too. Ivana, please. Um, thank you very much, and thanks for that very clear explanation uh, to Jerry. I suppose I just want, and I think the, the draft we have now is, is much better in terms of capturing the elements of the discussion yesterday. I suppose I just wanted to um, clarify a little more on the second question and the difference between a permi the permissive and the directive. Um, question that, uh, that we're suggesting. Uh, and I think, Jerry, as you've said, legally the permissive, um, making the amendment permissive, just say, saying the state may enact laws providing for same sex marriage, mm -hmm. doesn't pose any uh, un enforceable obligation immediately yeah. on the state. And I just think we need to be clear about that because yesterday we heard such passionately persuasive arguments in favour of the right to marriage equality, particularly from uh, two wonderful young people, Connor and Claire. And you know, it certainly seemed to me that if, if, if we wish to vote, uh, if those of us wish, who wish to vote in favour of civil marriage for same-sex couples are voting yes to question one, then we should be voting yes to the directive element of the amendment in question two. And I suppose that's more of a political point. It's not something, Jerry, that you may wish to offer a view on. But I think, just to be clear, that it's only the directive amendment saying the state shall enact laws providing for same-sex marriage that would provide an enforceable legal right to same-sex marriage for the couples and the individuals individuals and, and the people we heard from yesterday. And I suppose, you know, I was struck by something Chris said yesterday about the need to be positive and to be celebratory about this. That again, the directive uh, question saying the state shall provide for laws is the much more positive one. Uh, and I suppose the final point is just to say again that, you know, this is one provision rather different to the debate we had in the last session on, on uh, uh, the last weekend on women, uh, on the place of women in the home, where this change would have a very practical and immediate impact potentially in large numbers of people in Ireland and a very positive impact potentially. So uh, just again to say the legal effect would be it is inf an enforceable right uh, to same-sex marriage if the amendment is directive in nature, but it's not if it's permissive. In other words, the state simply may enact laws but doesn't have to. Thank you. Uh, I, again, and I want to make this perfectly clear, my only function is to explain the legal effect. It's up to you to make your decisions as to the choices, but the, the permissive will simply bring about a situation that the state can enact laws. It doesn't have to enact laws, it can enact laws. Obviously, if those laws were enacted, there'd be no question of them being unconstitutional, but it would not give any constitutional right. Um, the second is directive. It must enact laws, and obviously flowing from that, everybody has a right that those laws would be enacted and put in place. So it would be a matter of constitutional obligation under the shall. Okay, thank you. Firstly, Katrina, again, um, just to keep with, the... Gwyrma uh, Gwyrma 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 Sinn Féin is proud to, uh, of the fact that we led in the Assembly, along with Stephen Agnew, who's here today, um, in terms of marriage equality. And the reason we did that was because um, we believe in equality for everyone. And Ivana made a very important point about children. I, I think it is important, essential, that we actually fulfil what was written in the proclamation, which is to cherish all the children of the nation equally. And we don't have a great track record in doing that. We just have to look at, and I don't even like using the term uh, legitimate or illegitimate uh, Sorry, children. Katrina. No, no, and I'm coming to the point. Yeah, I'm coming to the point. I, I, I look, want to keep, this is about, well, is about the ballot paper. No, no, I know in, that. Yeah, and, okay. and I'm coming to the point about that because it's, it's about the, the final point there on the, the ballot paper. Um, what, what we need to do is ensure, we have a chance now in to do something really different 
and really the correct thing to do and to protect the rights of children. Um, and that's why I think the, the final point there, in the event of changed arrangements in relation to marriage, the state shall enact laws incorporating necessary changed arrangements. I, I think that wording could be slightly strengthened in relation to equality and constitutional protections of children. But I, I think this, this is the right thing uh, to, have, to uh, have that extra a uh, piece in there about the children and protection of children. And, and I do think we need to be directive because otherwise you just leave it to the whim of a government of the day. Thank you. I'm going to take people in the order in which I saw them. And Ronan, you were first. And the, after that, Stephen. And after that, Dara. Okay? And anyone else, obviously, who wants to, to come in. And then we go to the back. Yeah. Gormaga the Kahirli, Usajame on Berla, Nihegorit Willain, Diva Sagamer, Erin Wailgan, or Lok Nagailga. But um, just can I, I, I have to say at this point, we had excellent presentations yesterday, but I really must flag serious concerns about this ballot paper, I'm sorry to say. I think it, it doesn't reflect the diversity of views, in that those who have concerns, it seems to me, would only be able to vote no to this. Uh, and I think that there are such a range of different views that we ought to have wider options. The third question really does no more than make it a requirement what the state would have to do as a matter of practicality anyway, which would be to bring in laws. I think the first thing is that many of the concerns we all share around the need to promote an inclusive culture, to attack bullying, uh, to make changes in the area of guardianship, there is the option of doing a lot of that by legislation, and I think that should be there as an alternative in the first instance. But even more seriously, tolerance has to be a two-way street. And we heard a very clear request yesterday from good people, sincere people, people who support civil partnership, for example, but who wanted to make sure that in any constitutional change there would be a clause that acknowledges the rights of individuals, families, and organizations to espouse and to publicly espouse their vision of what marriage is, whether that should include same-sex marriage or whether it should be marriage between a man and a woman. So it seems to me that that freedom of conscience clause is vital, if only to make sure that such a referendum would pass, uh, but quite frankly, to be a properly inclusive society. We can't go from being intolerant in one direction to becoming completely intolerant in the other direction. So that freedom of conscience issue is critical, and it has to be stitched into the Constitution, it seems to me. The second concern has to do with unintended consequences. Despite the great efforts of our experts, there are many issues that we have not had a chance to think through fully. We've not, for example, heard from adoption experts. Some people in the area of adoption, particularly in the area of intra-country adoption, would take a strong view that heterosexual parenting is more desirable in that instance than same-sex parenting. We should at least leave the state free to legislate for those kind of distinctions. Or perhaps in the area of assisted human reproduction when we eventually legislate for it. Some people might take the view that if you're bringing children into the world, it should always be on the basis of heterosexual parenting. Whatever about other situations where gay parents will be parenting because of the natural events of life or the, the, the various events of life. The point is that and we have our legal experts here, but it is a fact that, for example, with the European Court of Human Rights, that whereas they leave member states free to, let's say, decide whether they will have same-sex marriage or not, once we do, if we make a blunt statement of equality, we might very well find that our hands are tied. I don't say that that's definite, but I certainly say that it's likely, or that it's possible. That, for example, Ireland might be told, well, actually, you can't make distinguish distinctions in your adoption law or you can't make distinctions in the area of assisted human reproduction because you have now formally created a position of equality, complete and blunt equality on, uh, as, uh, between different uh, same-sex and, and heterosexual marriage. Now, I may be right or I might be wrong about those concerns, but quite frankly, in one weekend, we have not had a chance to fully consider them. And for that reason, and I would say if only for that reason, we need to offer people the option of, of at least stating here whether they would like clauses included, A, to protect freedom of conscience, and B, to allow the state to make necessary distinctions if that is considered to be the best from the point of view of public policy. We may tie our hands just by simply making a change, introducing uh, a new definition of marriage across the board. Gurdamila Mahalat. Thank you. 
<coughs> we obviously did uh, attempt to uh, reflect the discussion or, as we thought in, in, in this, what, what we put before you this morning. Uh, I mean, clearly, uh, it, we want ultimately to have a ballot paper that everyone, as far as possible, everyone in the in the convention feels is the right form of ballot paper and giving the choice. And if we, uh, if there are omissions in it, I think we're open to uh, frame another question, if that's the case, if that is necessary. But we do have to frame it. Now I'm going to again take people in in order. Stephen was next. Thank you, Chair. Um, Stephen Agnew. Um, it's, I suppose it is a question of religious freedom. As Katrina said, uh, the Green Party and her party uh, put this motion forward in the Assembly, and unfortunately we're the only two parties who supported it fully. Um, but one thing that was, um, that's been important in the Assembly discussion, as well as the, the kind of UK-wide discussion, was uh, ensuring um, there is religious freedom. And in that sense, whilst we are here uh, proposing to legislate for civil marriage. I was just interested, um, not being as, as familiar with Irish law, would there be anything that prevented a church which wanted to solemnizing a, a same-sex marriage um, if they so desired? And, and reference was made yesterday to change in Attitudes Ireland, or, or trying to change the Church of Ireland position on same-sex marriage. So I, I'm just wondering um, if by uh, allowing for civil marriage, would, would there be anything else in Irish law which would stop churches which so desired from, from providing services for same-sex couples? Okay, I think it might be useful to go back to, to Jerry because, I mean, obviously there is currently a provision in the uh, Irish Constitution allowing for religious freedom. Now, that doesn't, I think, take account of, I mean, what Ronan Mullen is saying goes beyond that. But I think for clarification about the religious freedom issue, uh, Jerry, could you help us? Well, obviously, um, one, one, one article of the Constitution has to be read in the context of all the other articles of the Constitution. And this would not expressly interfere with the other articles. But, of course, it is possible when you're making constitutional change to write in to make it perfectly clear that it doesn't interfere with certain things. So that's quite possible to do that. Um, um, and it's... Frankly, I don't think it'd be very difficult to do it. Um, so um, that could be done. Um, uh, uh, that doesn't take away from the point that there is protections there now, and it doesn't purport to interfere with those protections. But if you want to spell it out, you can spell it out. And sometimes it's better to say things expressly than not say them or leave it, whatever. Uh, so the, the, it, it, it depends which way the convention wants to go at it, if I might put it that way. But legally, it, it's possible to do it. Um, in regard to the point that was asked about, I suspect, obviously, if there's going to be changes, if there was a, a suggested changes about, around marriage, there would be a, a legislative changes, and they would deal with issues of solemnization and whatever. I don't believe there'd be a problem leaving in the legislation that if a particular religious body was wanted to be involved in solemnization in a particular way, they could do that. No, well, uh, sorry, get you, could you have the microphone there? I, I think it's important to be clear that we're not, uh, well, sorry, we, I don't know who we is, I, I, yeah. I, I, the people I've been talking to have concerns. It's not just a matter of solemnizing marriages. I, I don't think there's actually a lot of fears okay. uh, that, you know, churches are going to be required to mm. solemnize marriages in violation of their own principles. I mean, th that, that might be some pe person's fear. I think it, it goes broader than that. It has to do with education. It has to do with what uh, vision of marriage is, is taught in schools. It has to do with the current protections of education in our constitution uh, and the ethos of schools. And we already know that these are fraught issues in our society. Uh, we've had at least two debates in the Shannad on the question of Section 37 and the rights of schools to make decisions in order to protect their ethos, even, even though there have been no court controversies. So let's not pretend that there isn't activism around these issues. There is. And I'm saying is if we want to be a tolerant society, we need to put certain issues beyond doubt, which is that if, for example, parents want their, to, their children to receive only an education that, that promotes a vision of marriage that is between men and women, or indeed parents want an a more aversion a or an education that refers to same-sex marriage, the point is 
that there is a danger of unforeseen consequences if we change our constitution in this way, that it will colour the way the courts will interpret the current freedoms that people have. And it isn't a question of whether you agree with those concerns that some people would have. It's a question of whether you believe that those people should be allowed to breathe and have their values in the society that you, that you, that you also want to live in. Um, so, so I, I, okay, I, don't so want, that, I, I just want to debate it. But it's certainly okay. not just about okay. a solemnization right. of, of okay. marriages. Yeah. Sorry, I, in terms of uh, sequence here, Dara was next. Uh, we'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, Dara O'Brien. Uh, firstly, I think the changes you've made so far, when we discussed this yesterday in relation to inserting civil marriage, I'm broadly happy with the, with the ballot paper. To follow on from a couple of points, and I mentioned it yesterday, I discussed this with, with Jared, is in relation to the area of education, ethos, religious freedoms and beliefs, regardless of what religion that is, or those of no faith indeed, that I think on the last question that we should be looking in, and I put this question directly to Jared yesterday, he said this morning it's possible to do, just so it's clear, is that after upbringing of children that we should insert something like and to protect the independence of religious institutions, beliefs and teachings. Because there will be consequences whereby that even with divestment from schools, uh, moving towards Educate Together schools, which is correct and allowing people choice, is that equality work, works both ways and respect in an inclusive society works across the board. So for those who who want to teach, who want to bring their kids up in faith schools, that would there be an impact on the change in the, in the Constitution should that occur in relation to how their teaching in relation to marriage and religious beliefs would be. So I think to make it clear from the Convention that the Convention here respects all people in this country and certainly wants to bring about equality, which I do, and I would like to see uh, same-sex civil marriages. That's what I want to see, but what I also want to see is to make sure that people's religious beliefs and teachings are actually respected also. That is covered. There is constitutional protection in the Constitution for religious beliefs. I think that, that this needs to be in your final question here, simply adding on at the end of it, and I would suggest to Cahirli that it's something along either to protect or respect the independence of religious institutions, beliefs and teachings. And that's what I would be proposing. I think we've discussed the issues over the last two days, uh, people are very clear about where we're at. I just think it might be helpful to have that absolute clarification tied in there. So I'll leave it at that, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, there's a number of people who have, have expressed the wish to speak, and I'm going to get to everybody who wants to, so just please bear with me in that regard. Uh, it is pretty clear at this stage that uh, we're not going to finish this discussion at half past ten. We're going to eat into some of the time we, we otherwise put aside for discussion. But this is so critical, we have to get the ballot paper right, so we're going to just take the time. Now, I'm, go I'm taking people in the order in which I saw them. Avril, power is next. Thank you, Chairman. I'm, I agree with the points that have been made about the importance of freedom of religion, but I think the Constitution, as far as I'm concerned, already provides sufficient protection there. Article 44.1 says that the state shall respect and honour religion. Article 44.2 guarantees freedom of choice and the free profession and practice of religion to every citizen. I think those provisions are already there. I think this is a very... Comp We're now moving from uh, two provision one provision of the Constitution to two. I think there are complicated issues here. There are issues around things like, while of course there, should be, there has to be freedom of religion, I think it's very important that we put in question one, civil marriage... I think that is absolutely crucial because, to my view, no religious congregation should be forced to marry a couple if they're not happy with doing that. We have to respect their choice not to do that. So we've already made sure that this is about civil rights. But there are a lot of complicated issues when you get into public services and whether, we're, whether as a state, we're happy to have services that are paid for by the public discriminate against people on the basis of their gender, their race, their sexual orientation. Very, very complicated issues. And there's already a lot of case law on Article 44 that achieves that balance. And I just worry that we haven't had that debate here um, and that suddenly this extra I issue in terms of a, an extra constitutional amendment has been thrown on the table at the end. And I, I just worry that we haven't had a chance to think it through properly. I think the Constitution already protects religion in very, very robust terms. And I think we should leave it to the Iraqis to ensure that there's a proper balance here. I absolutely have this sentiment, and I think that's been clear from everybody that has spoken over the last two days, that we want to make sure that there's equal protection for both rights. But that's already there. 
Um, and I think it would be wrong if we put in a, a, a two contradictory statements or try to mess with another clause that we haven't looked at and that we haven't looked at the case law on and that we haven't actually thought through properly. Okay, thank you. Dipna next, please. Again, just say your name for everybody. Hi, yeah, Dipna Byrne. Um, I suppose I want to echo what I was going to say, what Arvel just said. Also, I feel as uh, one of the 66 random members of the citizen that we should not also, uh, we should take everyone's view into, I know that some of the political people are a lot better at speaking than myself and maybe the other citizens, although we would agree. This is, we don't want to go over this, this legislation and framework there around, particularly in the area of child protection, which I would have an expertise around, and that is going through and Minister Fitzgerald um, and my, those of us that work in child protection would know this very well. So in the third area, I think that is very well catered for and currently has been worked on around child protection and around issues, and particularly since the children's referendum. Um, I do think, and I suppose I wanted to say, and I've been listening all day yesterday with great interest and would be in, in favour of equality and a yes vote on this, that we don't want to make it too complicated. We don't want to be bamboozled by people putting their views forward from their political organisations. I think we need to be very, very neutral and very, very fair on this. Um, and I suppose I wanted to say that as, as just a member of the 66. I do agree with this and I think it's a very good framework, but we don't we need to be bamboozled. And there are areas, particularly in the Constitution, as Arva said, and in the areas of child protection, that do already protect and legislate for the other areas that people have concerns about. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Catherine Murphy was next. Thanks very much, uh, Catherine Murphy. Um, just a number of things. In relation to the ballot paper, um, if, you, if, you, if you say yes, and then, you know, um, when you go into the next section and you're talking about whether it should be permissive or directive, if it's going to be permissive, I just wonder what's the point in putting in something that is permissive rather than directive, because it's more or less saying, yes, I'm in favour of it, but, uh, but I'm going to leave it to somebody else then to, uh, you know, to decide whether they should or shouldn't. And uh, I would have thought that... I would have thought that, you know, you, you can have equality, but not now is essentially, um, or not necessarily now, is the is is the the upshot of the first. If, you, if if it was the first one that was selected, for example, and I I, I just wondered why uh, why we would why would we would, would include it in that in in that way, because people can equally put on the ballot paper no. Um, so, so look at that's 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 just my thought on that particular one, but um, in relation to the constitution, um, I, I've raised the matter on a number of occasions in the Dáil when we've been debating different referendums, and the key, the answer continuously comes back that the constitution has to be uh, read in harmony. Um, so, if we start putting in sections or repeating sections. Uh, that are already in the Constitution does not, not cause problems later on in terms of potential challenges uh, because they're in a particular section. And maybe you might, uh, you might address that, uh, that particular aspect, or am I making myself clear about that? Mm. Um, because it's not about compartmentalising it, or my understanding of it is not about compartmentalising it, but that there is, that, but it has to be read in, in harmony. And the unintended consequences. Um, the, uh, I mean, I've heard all this unintended con consequences in relation to uh, two divorce referendums. I've, uh, you know, and we, it was going to it was going to change marriage as we knew it, but in actual fact, it did what was it what it, what it did what was was sought. It provided a, a way of people, you know, addressing broken relationships and 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 all of the rest of it. Um, and it wasn't about the whole um, of society breaking up and. You know, it, it, that, that was the fear that was put in about all of the unintended consequences at that time. I think this is about very simple things. Um, and let me put it on, I mean, I'm a very traditional person. I, I'm married, I'm married uh, in the 1970s. I'm still married to the same person. I got out and I campaigned for divorce um, because I saw people around me that, that required, um, they required, um, you know, a solution uh, to, 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 uh, to a, a very obvious problem that they have. I'm in favour of um, uh, providing the maximum legal protection for people and, and that includes uh, children. I, I think people should, if they have children, if at all possible, they should have a legal relationship and I don't see why that wouldn't extend to, uh, to, to every type of, 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 fam of family form. Um, and I think that's very tolerant. 
Um, and uh, uh, I, I'm really concerned about this this last provision that's been that's been talked about because I think yeah. there are serious unintended consequences about the if we put it in as a question and I'll finish on this mm. if we put it in as a question are we going to be talking about having about you know 25 different types of schools are we going to have you know are we going to have um, unintended consequences in relation to in relation to um, uh, in relation to uh, other public services mm. so I, th I think there are there are there are possible downsides to mm. uh, including something that is already included in the Constitution. Okay, thanks very much, Catherine. I'm, look, I'm conscious that we, we are operating under a time constraint here this morning as a convention. We're operating under a time constraint that we need to agree a ballot paper. Uh, my perspective is that we do need a ballot paper that is as simple as possible and that it does not get overly complicated. But equally, I want to make sure that the diversity of, of view in the Convention is, is acknowledged in some form. Jerry, could you deal with that particular issue that Catherine talked about, about you know, the, the, different, the fact the Constitution hangs together, if you like, and, and because this is an important point. And well, could, I, could I deal with two things, factually? Firstly, the first question Catherine asked, well, why bother for permissive? Why bother at all, if I might put it that way? Why, um, it actually does have an important constitutional function because what it would mean is, if, even if you put it in, in permissive terms, it says may, what it would mean is that if there was such legislation in the future, there is no chance that that legislation could be struck down as being unconstitutional by the courts. So that's the point. So it, it, it does fulfil an important constitutional function anyway in saying that. Whereas if it wasn't there, let's just say it stayed as it is, well then there would be the possibility that legislation would be struck down by the courts as being unconstitutional. So that's the answer to that. Yes, all the provisions of the constitution are interpreted together. It is a matter for the courts to decide how they will do. As I said yesterday, the thing about constitutional change is you can craft it whatever way you want. So if you, if you, you can either leave it to the courts to interpret how all the provisions will be taken together, or you can build into it how they are. Uh, for instance, you could put, and some articles in the Constitution do say this kind of thing, it might say, without prejudice to Article 40, whatever, uh, such and such will happen. So you can do all of that. It, it, it can be done that you can build up the balance in a way in the constitutional provision. Equally, you can leave it to the courts to balance out all the, the various sections. But I can't go further than to say what I've said, which is this, the, 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 it doesn't seem to be being suggested there would be any clear or express change in other provisions of the Constitution. They will remain, um, they will remain unaltered. It's a matter for the convention what the suggested balance. But could I just make the point to you? Obviously, when somebody, all you're doing is talking about changing the Constitution, um, a lot of thought would have to be given around all of this at the time as to how exactly you would word it, how you would do it. So what you need to, con what, what you need to think about is what is the principles you want to sort of say back to the the big picture, if I might put it that way, uh, say back to the Oireachtas that it should look at. Okay. okay, thank you for that. Now, given the number of people that want to speak, I I'm actually going to have to insist that people speak about what we are dealing with here, which is the ballot paper. So I want your opinions as to the adequacy of the ballot paper or not, and in the event that you think it's not, something should be different, be clear as far as possible what difference you want. Again, I'm taking people in order. I, I know, Chris Lyons, you were next, and then we're going to that table 14 after that, okay? Good morning, um, Chairperson, Chairman, and Convention. Um, to be honest, the section that I wanted to comment on was the third one, and it says, in the event of change arrangements in relation to marriage, the state shall enact laws incorporating necessary change arrangements in the regard of parentage, garden, and upbringing of children, and it's yes, no, or maybe. To be honest, I think that if we actually are updating the Constitution, irrespective of whether people think 
that the state should do it, it would be to my mind that I would be able to go to court with the constitution review in, or the reviewed constitution in hand and say that law is unconstitutional and I can have it affected. So I was wondering, are we saying that upon the amendment of the constitution to allow civil marriage, are we also saying that it will be on the state to immediately enact legislation which would deal with those areas or would it be up to a kind of a minority group to say that something is unconstitutional if we're not included? I just, it reads as a kind of a statement and less of a question to my mind. It's very specific. Jerry, can you deal with that? Well, I, I think what's intended is just to reflect what I said yesterday. If there is to be change in the constitutional arrangements, it is n inevitable that around that there will have to be legislative change in the arrangements in regard to children. Absolutely. Uh, and that what this is to, is to reflect that principle, okay. in effect, that the Convention is saying that. And uh, I've already said to you yesterday, if you change marriage you change the nature of the family, you change definitions you get in regard mm. to parenthood, all of that's going to have to flow one It, it just it reads as a strange, it would be a strange scenario whereby we would amend the constitution and no legislation would spring from it. Well, I think what that's this is actually is reflecting is to, that the convention is saying that the convention accepts that changes must flow from it. All right. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, that was the attempt to, to the logic. Now, table 14 has about three people at it. Aidan first, and then... Sorry, thanks, Aidan, the route on. Um, I won't repeat what other people have said. I just want to say I agree with Catherine Murphy on the, on the issue of permissive versus directive. Um, just as purely on the issue of unintended consequences that have been raised and should be included in the, in, in the draft paper. Look, we are not dealing with the situation, therefore, of, of the current family units that are unprotected under the Constitution. That's the reality. It's not about unintended consequences this will lead to. It's the fact that we have these families currently in our country unprotected by the Constitution. Lastly, on education. This is a complete red herring, in my view. Uh, the last time we had a, a constitutional change in the, in, the, in the marriage situation there was in terms of divorce. That had absolutely no impact on the religious instru in instruction of children in, in Irish primary and secondary schools. So I think that's clouding the issue. I think we need to keep it much simpler. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hi, Brona Farrell here. I just have a concern about the way the question one is framed. Um, you're basically asking people to say yes or no to same-sex marriage. But there are people who believe that marriage is between a man and a woman and that that should be left as it is with a provision in the Constitution to allow for same-sex couples to have the rights of married couples. But the way it's framed at the moment is that if you vote no, you're effectively saying that these people have no rights at all. You're not allowing for people who want to keep marriage as it stands, as well as allowing for civil partnerships with the same rights. And you're, you're effectively making people vote no to something that they don't necessarily agree with. You're not allowing an option to expand on what's there while protecting the rights of people who for however many years have worked in the definition of marriage being between a man and a woman. Thank you, Bruna. Uh, Mary, next. Thank you. Thank you. In the third part of the paper, I'd like added, please, uh, the word um, inheritance. I think that was reflected in many of the conversations at the tables yesterday. I think it has uh, huge implications for same-sex couples um, who have children because it also has tax implications through the revenue. And I'd also like us to think about citizenship because there is difficulty and it is going through the High Court at the moment about um, an issue around a passport for a child that has been um, brought into the country under surrogacy. So citizenship, I'd like added, and inheritance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jerry, would you, would you deal with that issue that Brona raised? Which is the, uh, I, I think firstly, if, if your view is, and I have to preface everything I'm saying here, I'm just trying to explain yeah. wh where, wh what it all means. I think your view is, if your view is there shouldn't be a constitutional provision that allows same-sex marriage, and that this should be dealt with purely by way of legislation, but perhaps enhanced legislation, um, then the vote would be no. I, I see Bona shaking her head. So, uh, well, perhaps if we could, could I just ask if it might be explained and then I'll try to deal with it. Yeah. 
A provision can be made in the Constitution. It, it's not necessarily just legislative. You can still allow in the Constitution a, a subclause for civil partnerships who have the same rights as marriage while protecting the rights of the definition of marriage doesn't need to be changed to facilitate same-sex couples having the same rights. But by definition, marriage is between a man and a woman, and that should be protected as much as the rights of same-sex couples in a civil partnership with the same rights. An addition can be added to the Constitution. It doesn't need to be just through legislation. Ah, all right. Well, if your view is that there should be a special provision in the Constitution dealing with giving constitutional rights to people in civil partnerships, that is not covered by these options. And in my view, you should vote no, because what you're saying is they shouldn't, people in same-sex couples shouldn't have the right to marry. And what you're saying is, no, they shouldn't have the right to marry. They should have a different form of constitutional protection. No, what I'm saying is the definition of marriage shouldn't be changed to accommodate the rights of civil well, partnerships. Well, th and then that's why I'm saying I think you vote no, because this is precisely saying mm. it should allow that. Mm. Can, you, can you not add that in as a clause? Because by voting no, you're voting no to something that you're not actually voting no to, because you're... Well, you are, because what you're saying is they shouldn't be entitled mm. to enter into a marriage. No, what I'm saying yeah. is you cannot change the definition of a word to include a group of people. The answer is, at the moment, yeah. you can change the Constitution any way you yeah. want. Uh, I, mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I would recall that we have been asked by the uh, motion of the Oireachtas to, uh, to an expressive view on whether the Constitution should be amended to allow for same-sex marriage. That is what we are required to do. Uh, I'm again taking, I'm going to take things again in order over here, John. Um, John Lardner, I'm going to repeat some of the comments from around the, the room and I'm going to reflect on the diversity within the room and w across our table here, we have great diversity on our table as there will be across this great state on this matter. I have a problem with the paper as well as it does not allow for greater diversity. I'm rehashing something from yesterday which I said there's nothing wrong with the wording in Article 41.3, wherein it protects for marriage for all sexes. The current issues that arise, that we're debating at the moment, arise out of the court's interpretation of the definition of marriage. I would ask that the paper provides for an option or an addition to be put into the Constitution to allow for the rights the same rights be given to civil partnerships. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, I'm just, I am trying to follow the, the sequence in which I saw people. Um, was there somebody further back there? No, no, you're, okay. W could we take Pat and then, then from table seven and then uh, from table three and then from table eight, okay? So, uh, Tom, rather, Tom, okay. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, I have the same concerns as Brona, and we were in a round table discussion last night in another room, and it was the issue that came up, and there was a substantial majority, uh, minority that were quite anxious to give uh, equal treatment, but not to use the word marriage. And possibly if I could suggest a wording for an additional question, should the Constitution be changed to allow for civil union with rights and obligations equal to those uh, of heterosexual couples? If that were included as an option, we're still given the, the, the vote on the question that the Oireachtas asked, but we're also giving a wider view of the uh, Convention. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, David O'Reilly, just in response, and I suppose as a question to Jerry, but in response to um, Ronan, which was kind of my launch pad, really, um, he mentioned under the third question as upbringing of children, and we talked about this issue of educating and religious education. 
But um, surely Article 42, in which the state acknowledges that the primary educator is the parent, surely that safeguards education along with the points Avril made um, about religion and the safeguards for religion and religious education. So in that case, and I'm looking for a bit of clarification from Jerry and Sarah perhaps, um, if we introduce this amendment, surely education and religious education would be protected by the clauses already in there um, when read in the light of the new clause as well. Okay, we, we'll take up a, co a couple more comments I'm coming up this way. Table, table six, there's two speakers at it. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Michael McCarthy, Table 6. Can I just agree wholeheartedly with the points well made by, by Avril in relation to the task at hand? I don't think we should overly complicate it. It's complex enough in areas, and we shouldn't bite off more than we can chew and stray into other areas. Now, my experience as a legislator, and we did this um, during my term as a senator, when we dealt with legislation and look at the may and the shall and the implications and the strength associated with the directive implication. Now, I want to ask Jory this. In his experience, and perhaps the Civil Partnership Act might be a case in point, this, did he see th the difference that instructing a directive as opposed to a permissive has made in terms of placing the requirement on government, whoever they are, uh, to do something? Because the, I think the permissive is just a bit watery and a bit weak, and it would just lead us down a road of where you could have can kicking by whatever administration. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Francis, I think you're next. Thank you very much. Um, I feel that the ballot paper reflects the discussion that we had yesterday. And I think it's important to go back to the, what we're being asked to do. We're being asked to go back to principles and the principle about equality, which we had a lot of discussion about yesterday in relation to same-sex couples. And uh, just two points I wanted to make. Um, we're talking about unintended consequences. And I think that can often be used to kind of scare people. And the point I want to make in relation to some of the issues we discussed, and I have a question about the ballot paper as well, is that uh, issues around, for example, adoption, assisted reproduction, surrogacy, um, they all have to be dealt with, undoubtedly, in this state. They're all on the agenda, whether or not we take a decision in relation to this issue here today or not. Um, obviously, there's another dimension um, if, for example, there was a, a yes vote to the proposition today. Um, so that's one point. Uh, the second point I want to make is that um, in relation to uh, the Constitution and issues around religious freedom and education, um, I would like Jerry to comment again um, on that issue of balancing um, if a new provision is put in uh, according to the principle we're looking at here today, um, how that particular principle applies and will impact on the rest of the Constitution. It might seem an obvious answer in some way that they're all taken in harmony and worked out, but you know, why would you need Jerry to particularly address the issues in relation to, uh, say, religious freedom or uh, the other points that have been made in relation to the principle we're taking here today? Or would it not just mean that you know a court uh, would look at the different uh, constitutional principles and balance them as they do at present anyway? Thank you, Francis. I think we better go back to Jerry now before we go on to any other comments because there's a few. Substantial comments. Um, sorry, I'm smiling because I'm thinking to myself, uh, I was expecting a slightly different uh, morning than I'm having. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, um, I'm going to try to deal with the points one by one. Um, the, uh, the, the, um, one contributor raised the issue of Article 42 and the issue of education and whether won't that cover the situation in regard to uh, education. Mm. As I understood Ronan's point, it, it's a, a multi-headed point, but some aspects of it are freedom of expression and freedom of belief points. Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure that that's covered by Article 42. I think what he's getting at is another difficulty. I do accept in terms of another aspect of education is covered by Article 42, but I think really the essence of what he's been talking about, as I have understood it, is freedom of expression and freedom of belief issues. That would be, at least I see him nodding to say that's, it's not, it's not the entirety of it, but it's the broad, it's the central thrust of it, if I might put it that way. Um, the next thing that somebody, again, another contributor dealt with the issue of a directory or, uh, um, that are mandatory or permissive. Um, again, I've explained that, and I'll explain it one more time. 
if it is permissive, there it simply is may, the Oireachtas doesn't have to do anything. If it shall, the Oireachtas must. I think it's reasonable to presume that the courts would give the Oireachtas a reasonable period to do what the Constitution tells it to do, but you can't, it couldn't be kicked down the line, or the can couldn't be kicked, if I might put it that way. Um, so that is the difference, and is the essential difference of it. Uh, and it is a very, very important difference. Um, somebody mentioned, when another contributor mentioned inheritance, um, uh, I think this would obviously be territory that would be covered. Uh, I think it's almost inevitable if you changed guardianship you would also change the law of inheritance by because the person would become a guardian of the child. So I think it is intended that it would be covered by that. And one of the reasons we used a broad word, upbringing, was to try to encompass everything without having to spell out every aspect of it. Because the danger of trying to spell out every aspect is you leave something out, if I might put it that way. <laughs> All right. Um, the, the next matter is the matter of religious... The, uh, Fr Francis's uh, point about uh, the, all the articles in the Constitution. It is an absolutely fundamental principle of constitutional interpretation that the courts inherit or try to interpret the Constitution and all the um, articles in harmony with each other. And it is only in circumstances where there is a conflict that they establish a hierarchy of constitutional rights where they say one right is more important than the other. Um, so if you just leave it and just uh, left it without making any specific arrangements in this regard, that's exactly the exercise which the court would do. It would try to balance all the rights and it would only get into issues of which right is more important than the other right if there was no way of balancing the rights in harmony with each other. I suppose what I have said is that, of course, if you're changing the Constitution, um, if you wish to give direction as to how that balancing exercise is to be done, you can do it in the sense of you can put in, for example, nothing in this article shall affect rights accruing from another article. So how you do that is a matter that can be done at the time and can be addressed at the time. There's no doubt about that. Um, but but um, uh, as a general proposition, I think the courts will probably approach it from the point of view that, if at all possible, rights which are given under one article are not taken away by another article unless it actually says that, or there is no other way of interpreting it that, uh, other than, say, it's taking away rights. Um, so, again, as I said, I keep coming back to this. One of the good things about changing the Constitution is if you want to change the rules, you can actually change them whatever way you want to define exactly the way you want to do it. I hope that's, um, that's helpful. I ho and I hope I've tried to address as fairly as I can each person's point as best I can understand it. Okay, okay I'm going to come, I'm coming up this way, Terence and then Catherine, and then I'm going to go back down that way, okay? And again, I really want people to focus their remarks, please, on the ballot paper and their views about it. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Terence uh, Flanagan. Um, I'm, just to say, I'm not happy uh, with the ballot paper. I think a new question has to be asked uh, expressly to include a strong, a strong protection for freedom of conscience, uh, freedom of religion and expression, and to protect uh, faith-based schools, the, you know, the ethos and the teachings of the various faith-based schools. Uh, I don't think members should have an issue with that, particularly for, if uh, points are only uh, being re reinforced that are already uh, included in the Constitution. I think it is very important, Chairman, that, um, that the diversity of opinion is included in the ballot paper. Okay, thank you. Catherine. Thank you, um, Catherine Zappone. Um, I think I have the unique distinction of being the only uh, married lesbian in the houses of the Oireachtas, and I speak from that perspective. Um, I, I, I want to uh, affirm the, um, the uh, amendments of the draft ballot from yesterday to today, uh, particularly in relation to the way the language has moved from same-sex marriage to marriage for same-sex couples. I am a married woman. Um, I got married. I don't have a same-sex marriage. I'm a married woman in, in a marriage. 
Um, secondly, I think what's emerging in light of these, um, our discussion this morning are two substantive issues. Okay. The first one has to do with whether or not there should be an additional piece to the ballot paper that um, offers the option for people to choose um, uh, civil partnership with full rights and entitlements uh, as married people have um, and to place that within our constitution. Um, and so that marriage and the, and the institution of marriage, the social socially highly valued institution of marriage is still only allowed for heterosexual people. So I think that's what's being placed uh, uh, as, as one of the substantive issues. Um, what I would like to say to that is that whereas I do appreciate that is, that is coming in light of a, the diversity of views and I do appreciate that many of you may feel and believe that that um, allows uh, you to make statements um, uh, a belief of a fully respecting of a person of my sexual identity. However, my own view and the reason that myself and my partner Anne Louise Gilligan 10 years initiated a series of legal battles in this case in order to have our Canadian marriage recognized here is that civil partnership would provide a lesser form of acknowledgement of who we are as a, a loving couple in terms of our lifelong partnership. Civil partnership does not emerge from the principle of equality. Civil partnership is a separate institution. Furthermore, the Civil Partnership Act currently, um, if one does happen to go outside the state to marry as a, as, a, as, a, as a same sex couple and come back into the state, the Civil Partnership effectively downgrades our relationship to civil partnership. I am married, I'm a married woman, but in the state of Ireland, it's you, the law says that I am a civil partner. And that is what, that, that's the reality of what that separate and distinctive institution is doing. And so the, I suppose, the, finally I say, I, it, is, it is not out of, of the principle of equality. The f legal battle that myself and my partner have been undertaking for the past 10 years, out of which there has been countless public debates, television, radio, analyses. Uh, uh, our, court, our judgment of our court case has been, is being taught up and down the country in all law schools. So we've had 10 years of analysis and debate. So I don't think this process is too slow. I think we're ready to make a decision. And I'm presuming that the extraordinary citizens here have been listening to that debate for the past 10 years. And so in, 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 in that case, um, that case, what we have simply been arguing for, and I think what's, what's, what's being placed before is, is that every human person has the right to marry the, pers the, the person they choose to love. Every human person has the right to marry the, the person they choose to love. So I think that, um, so just to say, first of all, that, that, that particular proposal possibly to add to the, to the ballot is, is rooted in a principle of a lack of equality, of, in, in my view. And I would say, I think, in light of what the chair has already said about the, the uh, houses of the Oireachtas have asked us to actually rule on marriage for same-sex couples, and what's being put before it is something that's different than that, that's a different than that, um, is that I think maybe this is an issue maybe that the chair has to rule on along with the advisory yeah. team. May I, can I just want to comment sure. on one or the other second substantive issue, which has to do with whether or not we need to add additional protections for effectively religious ethos. Um, there's two things I'd say about that. First of all, I, I mean, um, um, well, firstly, uh, three things. Firstly, I would, uh, I would believe, as a Averill and others have said, that there are plenty of protections in the Constitution for uh, respecting religious values and religious ethos in the context of education and, and, and other ways. Um, secondly, uh, when the uh, Constitution was amended to include divorce, to include divorce, there was no additional statement, in, at least as I'm reading the, the book now, of the Constitution. There was no additional statement of the need for protections uh, in, in terms of respecting uh, religious values in light of that. The reality is that clause in our Constitution does go against the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, but the people at the time did not feel the need to add an additional protection. And finally, and Ronan, Senator Mullen, my colleague in, in the Shannon, um, did raise the issue that we did discuss in terms of the Employment Equality Act. Um, there have been debates now and looking for an amendment to that act. Why is that? Because within that act, it was to try, it was uh, attempting to provide protections for um, uh, uh, lesbian and gay people. Um, and in, in the context of also respecting uh, the freedom uh, of, of religions as well. Um, in that act, in section 37, even though the act already in other sections of the act protects the religious ethos of schools, um, they, the, the Oireachtas at the time decided they needed to add an additional layer within Section 37 so that in terms of teachers or nurses or whatever, that, they, that, that, they, that, they, that the, the, the religious ethos would need to be protected in the context of who was employed, etc. So in that law, 
there are additional protections. The unintended consequence of that is that lesbian and gay teachers and nurses today feel discriminated against and don't feel as if they can uh, uh, conduct their, um, their, uh, their teaching and their profession in, open, in openness. So there is a problem with adding that additional protection and we are seeing it in the context of that particular law. So in that regard, I would be against the addition of any additional protections. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we are now... We are now an hour into this discussion. I know a number of people want to speak, and I want to facilitate anyone who wants to speak. But equally, we are going to get to a point where we are going to, ha as a convention, have to take a decision on a ballot paper. And that is, go I'm, I'm going to have to arrive at a determination as to uh, an, a suggestion as to what that ballot paper will be. So I'm going to take the re remaining people that I, that I see and uh, you know, I'm not going to let people back in again who've already spoken. So could we go to table seven, please? Um, John, John Connolly. Um, continually throughout this weekend, <coughs> it appears as if the people in favor of a status quo are supposed to be on the back foot. Uh, in terms of political correctness, we have to be very, very careful with, uh, with all our wordings. And we... Um, uh, political correctness uh, uh, often is used against anyone who is protecting or trying to protect the status quo. But if, if I might just quote you what the constitution of the moment, uh, and it will answer the last speaker's statement, the state is obliged to do, do what it has been doing in, in, its, it, in its defense of marriage. Because... 41.3. Sorry, Mike. Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Mike. Yeah, this, thank you. The state pledges, pledges itself to guard with special care the institution of marriage on which the family is founded and to protect it against attack. Now, just because the state has been protecting itself against the attack that it has been under, it is only it is, uh, having a regard to our own constitution, the constitution under which we live and have, and have worked. Now, the state has to show that it still upholds that act. And until it, it is changed in, in any uh, referendum or in any other way, uh, it ha is obliged to uh, protect and it pledges itself to protect. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle. Thank you, Michelle Mulhern. Uh, just, just firstly, just to say, I, I really welcome all the debate that's been had yesterday and today, and I think it really bodes well for us as a nation because it should always be about drawing circles of inclusiveness, whether it's our constitution or our laws, and never excluding people because of personal choices that they make in their lives. And that's, that's the way we're advancing. Uh, the one issue I'd like to speak to, which is uh, the freedom of expression in relation to religion and that, and I think, you know, a lot of people have stood up and they've cited pieces of legislation and they've, uh, they've read from the Constitution. We have heard from uh, Jerry up here, and basically what he has told us, yeah, it goes back to the courts. So we have people here purporting to, to interpret things, which even Jerry can't tell us because he would, uh, he would bow in deference to what a judge would say, and judges differ, etc. And we know in the Constitution, through case law, that there are, at times, rights that are assured to people which are competing. And then it's up to a judge to say which of the competing rights take precedent or in, in a certain case. And it is nuanced. But I think all it points to is that a concern has been expressed by one of our members here, uh, Ronan, about a possibility. And an assurance can't be given, and nobody can give it. Nobody reading anything from this constitution here can give that to him. And Jerry has given a vehicle and a means explaining how a constitution is draft, which we can explicitly, rather than implicitly, assume that a judge would allow things. We can explicitly say that. And I don't think that's an unreasonable proposition, um, because we're not in a position, no matter how forcefully, or if even 95% of people stood up here reading from it, doesn't make it so. It happens in the courts. I think it's, it's, it's a legitimate uh, um, proposition 
uh, that, that um, Ronan has made, particularly in light of we heard people from the church, they were invited here, they weren't invited here by accident, they were invited here for a reason yesterday, to give the full complement of the debate. Traditionally, we have been a very religious country, and our national identity has been tied up with that. So it's not that religion has been something forced on people of this country. We have moved on or evolved, or whatever the word is, as a society where we can accept differences and that's a good thing and we respect people and that's first and foremost it. But at the end of the day, uh, some of the teachings that, that come out may, if you talk about in the educational co context and you get down to the nuts and bolts, they may actually say, well, no, that, that's not the way to go in terms of same-sex marriage. Now, is that offensive? Does that break some law? We can't answer that right now. He's just looking for an assurance. I don't know what the big deal is, considering, you know, as I say, the generosity of all the discussion here uh, that I have heard. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Jerry. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to you again. The last couple of comments, I mean, we, we lead with the religious freedom aspect a little bit further on, perhaps with a, a suggestion, but the other, from the other gentleman there from Table 7, about the current situation of the Constitution. And well, I think the current situation of the Constitution I tried to explain it as best I could yesterday. Um, it's open to the people to change it any way they want and to make expressly clear exactly what they want. And I think that's what the discussion is about, whether they should do that and whether mm -hmm. how they should do that. But I, I can't put it any further than to say I tried to explain yesterday mm -hmm. what I understand the Constitution to presently say, okay. and I also tried to explain the ambiguities in it and how the sort of changes that are being discussed might make clearer certain things and would put beyond doubt certain things. Okay. And I think that's what the debate is all about. Okay. Thank you. We're, I mean, I'm going to actually have to put a guillotine on this discussion at, at 11.30, and I'm going to try and, you know, facilitate as many people as I can. John Hines is first, and then we're going back to, to that table. Thank you. Thank you, and Chair. This. Uh, yeah, I suppose just to say, and Chair, you said it yourself, that, um, um, and a number of people have said it too, that you know, we can't keep adding to the ballot paper at this stage. And a reminder that you know, the, the Oireachtas have asked us to deal with the issue of uh, ci uh, civil marriage for same-sex couples. And, uh, and that is the main issue. Um, I don't think that we live in a state whereby that anything, uh, or any unintended consequence, as, what, what, with, as the phrase that's been used here today, is going to make people's lives worse after this. And can I just remind people, and I'm just going to finish on this, can I remind people of, the, of, of what they heard yesterday? The amount of people I spoke to yesterday after, after yesterday's um, day, um, the passion, the emotion in the room yesterday, it was absolutely unbelievable. Um, I spoke to people at various tables here, and people felt enthused, they felt moved, People cried and so on yesterday. Because what were we talking about yesterday? And today it seems like we're not talking about this at all. What were we talking about? We were talking about people's lives. We were talking about real life situations that exist whether or not we think to do or not. They exist. We're talking about children. We're talking about loving couples like Catherine Sapone that mentioned there who are married. And I would all due respect to people who think even yes, give us rights but don't call it the same thing. That's still treating us differently. And in a society, that is not acceptable. You cannot do that. We are asking for everybody to be treated the same. And to even give gay and lesbian couples the same rights, but call it something, is still admitting that you think there is something different. But there is more the same than different between people. And remember that today. And remember that the only issue that you have been asked and charged as a member of the Constitutional Convention is should we allow for same-sex marriage, uh, for, or, or civil marriage for same-sex couples? That is the issue. Everything else beyond that will be taken care of, without a doubt, by the legislators and uh, by, by the Oireachtas. But that is the issue here today. And remember that, please. I really, really ask you to remember that, because we're getting very legal. And mm. the only legal experts are really the people up there. But it sounds like everybody here seems to think we're, you know, that they have a legal um, you know, sense. You know, the humanity of this situation is you have a choice here today to change the way Irish society is and to change it for the better. And to leave it as it is or to bring it closely to being different 
is serving some people differently than others. And that is not acceptable in a republic. And I must say, can I just finish in this, Tom? It was only yesterday that I really understood, when I heard so many other people say it as well, what a republic means. We use the word so many times, but yesterday the penny dropped for me as a 35-year-old. A republic, a republic where everybody is treated the same with the best possible rights. And that's what we live in. But we're falling short of being a real republic. And I mean that in the best, most passionate sense. And remember that today. Anything less than full civil marriage for every single individual, regardless of their sexuality, is a discrimination. And call it anything else, but it's a discrimination. And if you are happy to discriminate against people, you know, that's your prerogative. But I'm most certainly not happy to, to discriminate against anybody, whether it be sexuality, race, gender, or anything else. And I ask that you remember that today when you do actually get the final panel paper. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, yeah. my Thank name you. is uh, Fiona Wielden. Um, religion needs to be taken out of the equation completely. We are talking about civil marriage. I had a civil marriage, and I believe it was a lot more fulfilling than any religious ceremony could be. People have been talking a lot about the freedom of religious beliefs, but there also has to be freedom for people who don't have religious beliefs. I understand people's concern about the change from the current interpretation of marriage, but we should, be, we should not be afraid to make that change. Society is changing, and it's great that it does. And I agree with the last speaker and Catherine in saying that civil partnership and marriage, they're different names, and they, they don't give equal status by having the different names. Thanks, Fiona. Could we go to table 12, please? There are two people who need to speak at table 12. At least two. And then we'll come to you, Alan. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, Chair Mascara. Um, I think, you know, obviously yesterday and today we have had a very passionate debate about this issue. And the thought struck me yesterday evening, given the seriousness of the subject we're discussing, is the time allowed for it within the Constitutional Convention, is it adequate? And I'm, I suppose that's, I'm not making a call or a judgment on it. I'm sure it's something that you as Chairman of the Convention uh, will be considering. Of any of the range of subjects that has been put before us to be considered, it is one of the more serious ones. And the, any possible constitutional change that will flow from the deliberations here, and it does obviously beg the question as well, uh, the status of reports coming from the Convention going for, to the Government, to the Taoiseach or the Minister for Justice or whoever it might be, uh, are the Government obliged to accept the recommendation, the specific recommendation uh, of the Convention here or can they modify, can they change it uh, or what is the obligation position uh, in relation to it? Now, the realities are that any constitutional change, there is the inevitable pendulum effect with that change. And we are taking the assurance of uh, our legal advisers here uh, that constitutional change, that other provisions in the Constitution, if there are aspects of unintended consequences, that other provisions in the Constitution will cater for those. I'm not so sure about that. And there has been, I suppose, the evolution of a grey area in relation to it. We have the and a very fine ex, uh, expert panel uh, who have advisors in different aspects. Similarly, down the floor, we have had a number of lawyers, for instance, Roland Mullen is a barrister, uh, Michelle Mulhern is a solicitor, and they are two uh, who have voiced particular opinions in relation to the possible unintended consequences of change in this area. And, you know, it begs the question, do we need a period of reflection in relation to it? You know, at the end of the day, if the Constitutional Convention comes down and makes a decision on a specific recommendation, a combination of recommendations to the government, and the find in a fortnight's time, really that's an aspect of it uh, that we should have given more thought to. With the specific recommendation that a constitutional change be advanced by way of referendum, it is going to have consequences uh, in, particular, in other particular areas. I don't think that it was intended that the convention role uh, was to glide over, uh, in a simple way, any possible unintended consequences of changes that it might recommend. And I think that we perhaps maybe should reflect that in the questions that would be put in, 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 in the redrafting of the questions to the convention here today. Thank you very much, Seamus. Um, Jerry. Uh, Gamago, <clears throat> um, the question 
that were being asked today, Chairman, in the context of the the permissive, I'm not convinced, Jerry, that we need to put in permissive as opposed to directive. But I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a, a legal expert, but could I just appeal to the members of the convention? We've had a very positive engagement. And to the gentleman on table seven, I hope you are never felt that we who are in favour of the proposition disrespected your viewpoint. I'm not attacking the marriage that you propose to have. It's because of the value, the cherishing of it. What I saw and what I see every day in my life is why I want to be married with my partner because of what you have to enhance, to enrich my life and the life of people around me who are gay as well. And I would love you to come to my marriage whenever it happens, if we vote today here, because I respect your position and I will never attack the institution of marriage because marriage is about the commitment and love of two people, be they heterosexual or be they gay. And no matter where we are in the world, the love that is within the institution of marriage should never be in any way undermined. And this debate today here and yesterday, to me, as a gay person, enhances marriage because it's about the values that you and I both share. Could I just make the comment, Kyrick, on this regarding the unintended and unforeseen circumstances? It's a red herring. I teach religion in school before I became a member of Dáil Éireann. I could have been dismissed from my job for being a gay man. Is that right? I would think many of us here would say it's not. The articles in the Constitution as a lay person preserve and protect religious freedom and religious opinion. And we should never lose sight of that. We can quote scripture, we can quote the Bible, we can quote the Constitution, or we can quote the law to interpret whatever way we want. But our Constitution is quite clear on that. And could I just thank all the delegates for, and the members of the Convention for your genuineness in this debate. This has enhanced the Irish Republic that we're all proud of. And hopefully someday we'll have a united Ireland where we'll be all equal. But to me, Cahirach, this debate today is about me and you as citizens being equal and not being divided. And thank you for your generosity of spirit and thank you for your patience. This is one of the most important things we'll ever do. It's about us as a society and as citizens and individuals. Not about faith, not about religion, not about... It's about us as people, humanity. You should be very proud of yourselves this weekend because we've done a great service for the people who've put us here. Thank you. Oh, oh, sorry, 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 I'm sorry. Actually, sorry, table five, Alan, and then we're going to 13, and then we're going over there. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'd just like to echo um, Jerry's comments there, and particularly direct uh, my response towards John at table seven. Um, as Jerry said, what we're proposing here is by no means an attack on marriage. What we're proposing is to open up the institution of marriage so that it can be shared equally among all of the citizens. Um, personally, I find it very hurtful when people express the view that maybe my decision in the future to profess publicly my love for uh, a partner would in any way undermine or devalue existing marriages. Why, and, and I, I welcome comment and response on this from anyone, but why would opening up such a fantastic institution to everyone devalue existing marriages? It just it makes absolutely no sense to me. And you, you quote the, uh, Article 41.3 where the state pledges to guard with special care the institution of marriage and protect it against attack. Okay? And what I'm saying here is we are not attacking marriage. Marriage is not defined in the Constitution as bet be being between one man and one woman. It is not defined like that. It's the court's interpretation of the Constitution that defines that. And again, relating to the second question on the ballot paper, uh, I'd like to reiterate the point that was made by a number of uh, members here today, that I don't believe we should really need to include the option for the permissive wording. The Constitution, as it stands, is already permissive. There is nothing in the Constitution that is, uh, can be held as an impediment to uh, civil marriage for same-sex couples. So I, I think this option on the ballot paper is entirely redundant. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to table 13. We're, we're running very close now to the end of the contributions. 
from the floor. So could I again ask people to be very brief because we have very little time left. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd just like to say, I, I just thought this whole weekend it was a privilege to be here and a privilege to work with, with everybody, and I'd just like to say th thank you. Um, but the reason that we are here today, as has been uh, mooted around the tables, is that we are here for equality. And, you know, that's the, the key thing that we need to remember, that this is about equality and it's about marriage equality. It's about equality for everybody, whether they be you know, Catholic, Protestant, black, white, creed or religion, that we are here to give. And I, I just can't um, emphasize just enough how important I think it is that we do recognize it, that we do move on. Some of the suggestions have been that we delay, that we look at other things. Um, you know, I think that's kicking the can down the road. We need, we need, we are ready, more than ready to make, make the decision now. And, and that this decision should be made here today. The whole point about the religion and, um, about the religious ethos in school, like, like Jerry, I, I, I was a, a teacher in a religious led, um, secondary school. And, um, you know, certainly, you know, you talk about the discrimination about the children and looking after the children. And the children are more than um, looked after in the Constitution. We, we've only got to look at some of the services and some of the failings in the services, and that's going off on a totally different route if you want to kind of see, are we, are we upholding and are we looking after our children? But um, in in you know in in some of the in, in some of the cases where they talk about about the child, as, as has been pointed out, the, the chief educator in the, in a child's life is the parent. And whether you be at a Protestant school or a Catholic school or whatever, it certainly. And I have five children who have gone through it. It certainly wouldn't interfere my bringing up of them, no matter what kind of a school that they, you know that they attended. So I think that's just you know it's pushing it's pushing the issue out. Um, you know, we all deserve a religious freedom and we all deserve... I, I've been contacted by loads of people, as I'm sure other people here have, about, you know, please can you ensure that I have the right to a marriage? Please can you... Why should, why should, why should they have to even ask? You know, I think that the time has long gone where, where, you know, we need to vote. And I don't okay. think it needs to be permissive. I think it, sh it should be shall. Okay. You know, Th I thank think you. Thank you. Over there, uh, Mary Lou, and then... Yeah, uh, uh, just two observations. Yeah. Um, I think there would be a real danger if the debate was simply around the unintended consequences, whatever they might be of, of potential constitutional change. The focus in the first instance needs to be on the intended consequence of this change, which is not an attack on marriage. It's in fact an affirmation of the legal and social institution of marriage. And it is, as others ha have said, in my view, a simple equality call. You know, if you were to second guess um, in, in a very technical way constitutional change and become almost captive to the fear of unintended consequences, uh, I doubt that we would have seen any level of constitutional change for any social grouping uh, over the generations. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is this, because the issue of, of freedom of expression, the protection of, of religious uh, liberties is absolutely essential. And I, for one, would be a, a strong advocate of pe per parental right to faith-based education. I think that's really, that's an important freedom. However, I, I don't think that that should be used to assert an argument that says, therefore, the Constitution needs to reflect a particular ethos. And the Constitution has to be a place where you accommodate difference, where you afford equality to citizens, and then as part of that that you acknowledge people's religious uh, freedoms and liberties. But we have a history and a tradition in this state of a Catholic ethos driving and guiding the constitutional parameters of our state. Um, I, I don't think that was ever a good thing, uh, and it's certainly not an acceptable thing now. And I just get very anxious if uh, an argument around protecting your religious liberty is used in effect almost as a Trojan horse to say the Constitution needs to, rem to remain within a Catholic ethos. That's, that's not, and that's what I understood to be advanced. And I think that's a, a very, very dangerous thing. I think the ballot paper is entirely adequate. I don't see a difficulty in people being asked the directive versus permissive question. Let's take a, a view on it. Mm. But let's not wrap ourselves up in knots and st try to second-guess the courts. The question is, should marriage rights, full marriage rights, 
be afford, afforded to citizens, mm. irrespective of their sexual orientation. That, that's the core of okay. what we're being asked here. Thank you very much. Joan, I want you to have, you're going to have the last word. Thank you very much. Very, very briefly, I'd just like everyone to please remember what one of the people who spoke to us yesterday said about these unintended consequences. What were the consequences when he got married? A gay couple got married, simple as that. And all throughout the world where gay people are able to get married, the consequence is that they get married, nothing more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, what I'm going to do in a moment is, um, is ask you basically about the, the, about, about the ballot paper. But before that, I, I, do, I would like Jerry to, because this issue of religious freedom, etc., uh, has, has come up on a number of occasions. I'd like you again to tell us what the Constitution in its current form provides for and the consequences of that religious freedom. The Constitution provides for it. It protects freedom of religion. It protects freedom of expression. And um, uh, it, uh, I think it would, in, uh, it would outlaw any uh, interference with either of those freedoms. Um, if there is a change in the uh, constitutional provisions in regard to same-sex marriage, I think the courts would look at all those articles together and say, is there, uh, is there some way that we can interpret them all so that we don't take away from what's given in one article because of the provisions of another article unless there is no way of reconciling them. If there is some way, if there's no way of reconciling them, then we establish a hierarchy. We say which one is more important and we vindicate the one that's more important. That's what the law says, as I understand. Okay. Okay, um, I, I'm basically going to, with the, the ballot paper that's before you after all this, this discussion for the last hour and a half, um, I'm going to ask, uh, do, do you agree with the question by, to vote question by question on the ballot paper? Does the convention agree that the first question should be the subject of a vote? Okay. The second issue, I know there's been some discussion as to whether it's necessary or to, to have permissive a directive, but uh, I'm putting to the convention, should the question in its current form, uh, with the two options, and they are mutually exclusive, you can't vote for both obviously, um, does the convention wish to, to vote on this second question? Okay. The third question um, is, is, is as, as is, I know Mary, Mr. O'Connor raised a question about adding things. I think Jerry gave a response which I think said that, well, he did say that, in fact, what you were asking for is implicit in, in that, so I think it. So in regard to this third question, because it is a very clear uh, uh, consequence of, in the event that there was to be change, a recognition that there are a number of other legislative uh, consequences or legislative things that would have to happen. And that's the reason we put it to you, so that we are quite explicit. It's not, all about, it's not about the unintended consequences. It, it is about in consequential things that would have to happen in the event of a change uh, re arrangement in relation to, to same-sex marriage. So do, does the convention wish to vote on that third question? Yeah, there are a couple of no's, so could we have a show of hands on that? In favour, those who want to vote on this third question, those who think, who don't want to vote on it, or who, who disagree with this third question, Okay, there, I'm afraid there, there is a very large majority in favour of voting in this question in its current form. Where's Ronan's piece? Yeah. Ronan Mullen um, has suggested a, a form of words as, which would cover what he was uh, expressing in his, his verbal intervention uh, as a possibility. Now, I know this is... This, I'm sorry, can I have attention, please? Um, Ronan Mullen has suggested a form of words uh, 
which I'll, I'll first of all read, and then I may ask Jerry to, to uh, comment on them. Um, th the suggested form of words is, the state in, it, in its enactments shall have regard to the rights of individuals, families, and organizations to espouse their preferred understanding of marriage, and the state may make appropriate distinctions in order to secure the best interests of people, now, of children, other. Now, clearly, that is, um, you know, there may be a lot behind those words, which, you know, we would need time to consider and understand. But as an initial response to that suggested wording, Jerry, what comment do you have? Uh, firstly, uh, it, it, it has, uh, I've only seen this, and I'm grateful it was sent up to me, so I did get a chance to have a quick look at it. Um, uh, the, the, the first thing is, if what is required is simpl simply something that copper fastens and make it clear that there's not to be an interference with freedom of belief and religion, I, I think there's much simpler ways you could do that. Uh, uh, you could write a sentence that could do that much more clearly and much more simply uh, in, in what it says. I suspect that the format there, if I could might, if I might say there might be unintended consequences of that. Uh, for example, the thing that I immediately came to mind when I said, when I saw the state in its enactment shall have regard to the rights of individual families and organizations to espouse their professed understanding of marriage. Um, it, um, there's a very, uh, a lot of marriages in the world are Islamic marriages, and uh, some Islamic marriages are, are either uh, actually or potentially polygamous marriages. Uh, would you, in some way, bring them into the into the, the th that's their understanding, if I might put it, of marriage? Uh, and, and that it, it's just I'm just uh, it's just one thing that jumped into my mind. The second thing that that I say is. I'm, I'm not sure that I understand necessarily the link between the first piece of the, uh, which talks about the understanding of marriage and the second bit that says, and make, make appropriate distinctions uh, in, a, in order to secure the best interests of children. Um, now, uh, in fairness, uh, um, I did, the very first words I uttered yesterday is that I do not profess to be all-knowing. And um, so uh, I simply say they're just almost a set of quick random thoughts having seen it 10 minutes ago but but if there was if it's simply to just make sure that it makes clear that it doesn't interfere with freedoms of expression or belief there's a much simpler way of doing it Ronan, yeah briefly could yeah yeah if i just might just speak to it very briefly and thank you jerry Needless to say, as <laughs> it's not exactly ideal circumstances for legal drafting. I, I, I think I give that 28 seconds. So um, I think the point, I, first of all, in relation to, it's not just religious freedom, it's philosophical freedom. And I think allowing people to es espouse views, even vis-a-vis -vis polygamous marriage, mightn't like it myself, but we're talking about freedom of expression. We're not necessarily, that wouldn't necessarily suggest that the state has to enact such a definition of marriage, needless to say. But it's the idea of allowing people, as I say, to live and breathe their culture. You know, people have questions about textbooks in schools, about, you know, the state is allowed to dictate a certain curriculum, for example. Uh, and, and whether that, you know, and we all have to be honest, the courts have to, as, as Jerry said, take these things harmoniously, and there can be surprising decisions from courts. In the second issue is the idea of uh, making appropriate distinctions in, in relation to the best interests of children. We've had a children's rights referendum, as you all know, very recently. Again, the issue here is that uh, we didn't really get much of a chance to discuss what the impact of the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms uh, would be. But there is case law where once member states set up uh, a law and change their laws, they can, then be, they can then tie their hands and they can then be interpreted as having to do certain things. And if it was a thing that the state did want to make distinctions around adoption, same-sex adoption, the context of intra-country adoption, or indeed in relation to assisted human reproduction, it is possible that a blunt statement of equality might actually tie our hands, whether through the decisions of our own courts or the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights specifically. I haven't even considered, nor have I had the chance to consider the impact of, of, of the European Union Court, okay, or the ECJ. So anyway, that, that's just my attempt to speak to those two issues. We did get a lot of a chance to talk about religious freedom, although it's not just religious freedom, mm. it's philosophical freedom. 
This isn't about protecting the rights of bigoted people to have bigoted views. This is about allowing people to express their values in full and not to feel like second-class citizens. We've already heard from one gentleman who feels a vibe of intimidation. I'm not to put words in his mouth. Uh, but we c- now Sorry. I'm feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think we did not... And, and it is true to say that some of the politicians have gone in very heavy with their influence today. I'm in a minority of one among the politicians. Uh, but I think we all have to be able to have our values expressed in full. Mm. But the second question is, which we really didn't have a chance to discuss in this morning's discussion, is that question about whether the state will have the necessary freedom to make distinctions that it might see as being in the common good, or whether it, we would tie its hands, tie the Oireachtas' hands, by an overly blunt statement. Uh, and that is the issue, and I think it's a serious issue, and I think we ought to consider it. Gramila Mahal. Thank you. I'm reluctant, Francis, to allow, because if I allow open it further, uh, you know, there will be other people with full legitimacy to come in. Uh, The conclusion I have to draw on this is that, uh, Ronan, the the draft you, I mean, firstly, we we don't have, I think, time to to discuss your your draft, and I think Jerry has indeed said that there may be other ways of of guaranteeing, so I'm not proposing that we put your proposition to the convention. Well, I, I don't think at this time of the day, at this time of the, ver- of, of the, of the weekend, we, we really can reopen this. I am proposing that we confine our voting to the three questions that you have, as a convention, agreed to vote upon. Is that agreed? Fine. Now, the, given that we have only very recently fo- finalized the, the text, uh, although the draft, it was in draft form, and we needed to get it translated into Irish, and it will, that is, is, is happening as we speak, and it will, the final versions in English and Irish will be available within ten, within 10 minutes. I suggest we have a cup of coffee for 10 minutes, and then we vote as soon as that happens. Okay, thank you.